Melbourne is currently in the very happy grip of Priscilla Mania. And in the first part of our tribute to this iconic Australian creation, we present part one of our chat with show business legend and star of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert the musical, Tony Sheldon. And yes, he's here with us right now, um, making it big right here at the Regent Theatre. In Priscilla, we have the iconic Tony Sheldon. Tony, how are you oh, going? Iconic. Oh, I'm feeling very iconic. <laughs> <laughs> have, you been, have you been called an icon before? Uh, an acorn, perhaps, not an icon. An acorn? I figure if you, if you hang around long enough, the older you get, suddenly you, you attain iconic status. It sort of it seems to come naturally, doesn't it? It, it just sort, sort of, of does. One day you're just an actor who can't get a job, and then suddenly you're an icon, and it happens overnight. <laughs> My mother, it happened to Mum. And, well, you she's know, definitely an icon. <laughs> she, she certainly is, yeah. Now, welcome back to Melbourne as well from a, a triumphant season in Sydney. How was it? It was really big up there, wasn't it? It was fantastic. We ran a year, and uh, it it went through the roof. I mean, we had people who came and saw the show more than fifty times. It it garnered a devoted following, which was extraordinary, considering that we we were um, dismissed pretty much by the critics and by the uh, the uh, the. The high class, the high toned theatre commentators who just said, oh, it's a terrible, trashy old jukebox show, but we turned out to be an audience show. Definitely. I mean, I, when it first was coming to Melbourne, I saw it written that, oh, you know, it went down well with the Sydney crowd, but the Melbourne crowd aren't going to go for it. Now, is the mindset really that different, or is this all just media? crap it's it's see it's people have such preconceived ideas about the, the film I mean the problem we had in Sydney was was nobody knew what the show was anyway so it was hard to, to yeah. sell a, a show that nobody knew what it was apart from the film uh, the other thing we get is straight guys saying oh I wouldn't like that this is before they even walk in the door they've yeah. made up their mind they won't like it so have you ever had any feedback from straight you know, straight male audience members saying, oh, you've changed my thinking on things. You know? Not might change my thinking, but gee, that was a bloody good show. And I'm going to come and see that again. But we've, we've been, we've had comments from, from people saying, oh, my husband won't come because he'll get a ribbing from his mates at work. <laughs> that, that a man, a straight guy would be sent up by his mates at work for going to see a show. I mean, please. Very what? Australian, isn't it? <laughs> yes, but I mean, what sort of dark ages are we living in that that disturbs people? You know, are they going to turn up, you know, with their coats turned up and dark glasses in case, you know, someone from the machine shop sees them? Well, under the Howard Epoch, I think possibly they would. Well, <laughs> well highly likely. But, you know, you do not catch poofterism from seeing Priscilla. Everybody relax. Exactly. If it's there, it's there, guys. Get over it. Yeah. And, yeah. and the show, I think, is better here because we've made some changes, uh, specifically to... to to make the storyline clearer. What sort of what sort of changes have you actually made? Well, the big problem we found was that because there are three leading characters, uh, they weren't their stories weren't getting equal time. Oh, I see. And uh, basically, we found that the character of Tick, who was played in the film by Hugo Weaving, mm -hmm. uh, his story, his journey wasn't clear, and it is in fact the focal journey, Jeremy Stanford's uh, character. So we uh, we take a bit more time to set it up, that, that he has a son that he doesn't know, and that it's time for him. He's at a crossroads where he's working in a drag club and he, he doesn't like it, and uh, it's time for a change in his life. Let's go and meet this boy who he thinks about every day, but actually hasn't met. Yeah. Uh, did, you'd seem so perfect for the role of Bernadette. I mean, did they have you in mind for it from the get-go, or were you up with some, you know, a whole crew of other people? Uh, I... I was invited to do the very first workshop by, right. by Simon Phillips a year ago, which was, was hysterical because I had a full beard and uh, I, I went in there. The first thing I said to them was, I wouldn't be able to actually do the show according to the dates. And they said, we're not asking you to do the show. We're asking you to do the <laughs> workshop. I went, oh, well, pardon me. So I turned up and did some work on it. And it was great because Simon let me have a lot of input mm -hmm. into the way the show was structured and in the way my character would go. There were a lot of things uh, that were said in the original script that with things like, oh, little Johnny Howard was right, um, homosexuals shouldn't be allowed near children to raise... Ch and I said, I'm not putting that out, thank you, um, to, to an audience of people who might take that as, you know, gospel. gospel. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was really allowed to, to keep a firm rein on the sort of things that Bernadette says, because mm -hmm. we had to keep in mind this is the first mainstream Australian show, probably the first mainstream show anywhere, where the leading characters are three homosexuals. I mean, even La Cage of only has two. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, we had to be very responsible about what the script said. Now, in Sydney you had a few technical problems, didn't you, with the, the star of the show, Priscilla herself? The star of the show, yes, we were told that by the producers. The bus is the star of the show, that's why we're not 
we're not putting your name on the poster. Well, the star wouldn't come out of the dressing room for the first four performances. It's uh, it's a technological marvel, the yeah. bus, and uh, it, it is a giant computer, the, yeah. the thing, and so it's all operated by sort of people with remote control things, and apparently you can only feed in one command at a time. You can't like program it for the whole show and go, Bob's your uncle. You've actually got to sit and do it because if you do more than two, it, it has a nervous breakdown. So it runs so. on Windows and it's not a Mac? Pretty much like that, <laughs> yes. And, and and weird things do happen, like you'll be standing and suddenly, you know, you'll be doing a scene and suddenly the stage manager screams, jump, get off stage, get off stage. And you suddenly see this thing is coming towards you, you know, Oops. of its own. It, it had a mind of its own. The, the command hadn't been fed into it and it walked towards us. Oh, right. Like, you know, yes, the, the big iron giant or whatever it was. And did this actually happen during a performance? It certainly did, yeah, yeah. during quite a moving moment. I couldn't understand why people suddenly were getting nervous. It was because <laughs> this thing was coming towards us like that. So. Is it hard to get back in your stride after that happens? Oh, actually, we've, we've had a few. I think, I think people like the thrill of being involved in in Life. moments like yeah. that when it looks like the bus is going to actually eat us. <laughs> I think it gives us that extra frisson. Now, I've just noticed your, your hands made up there. You're, you're in semi... I have to live with these. They, uh, that's the thing they don't tell you about nail polish. It takes so long to dry. Um, so I have to put it on. My day off is Monday. So I take it off Sunday night after the show. Yippee. And then I put it back on on Tuesday, early Tuesday afternoon, because it takes, like, three or four hours before it's absolutely rock hard yeah. and then I just leave it on for the rest of the week because I have a life and yeah. I don't want to spend it waiting for these to dry. Indeed. Um, now it's, not the, it's not the first time you've delved into drag is it with uh, the producers? The producers but that was only one one scene and it was sort of silly drag in that I wasn't wearing makeup or anything he was just in the Chrysler building dress Yeah. Um, but there was sort of yeah he was getting dressed up to go to a drag ball mm -hmm. um, but I have done drag previously I, um, the, there used to be a place called the Tilbury Hotel in mm -hmm. Sydney yes. and I did Sunset Boulevard the Panto and I was Norman Desmond in that oh, um, and uh, which was wonderful because people used to arrive in Sydney thinking it was the real Sunset Boulevard and there we were <laughs> oh. three of us playing all the roles on this tiny little pub stage um, <laughs> yes and while Debbie Byrne was down here in this very theatre doing the real thing um, ah. yeah I've, I've thrown on a frock a few times over the years but people tend to think I live in a frock, I think, and um, I don't. There's only been four or five roles out of, you know, 150. Yeah, yeah a fraction of your career, but those sort of things, yeah, really stay they, with you, don't uh, they? Yes, the mud sticks, uh, the chiffon sticks. Indeed. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I take it as a tribute to the fact that I do it well then, I guess, and people go, get him, because, you. you know, he looks good in a in a corset and high heels. <laughs> yes. It's playing havoc with my spinal column. Oh, so yeah. hey, we won't go into that. <laughs>